Hello everybody and welcome to The Unshackled. Uh, here today we have another episode of Debt Nation. We have a guest on, Stephen Wells. He's a man, he's a climate change guy. I met him at Liberty Fest. It was a fantastic festival. Uh, we talked a lot about Austrian economics. We talked about a lot about Friedman and we talked about a lot about Liberty and, you know, free markets and all that sort of good stuff. So he's going to be co-hosting me and helping me out, dragging me through uh, what's known as the Iran crisis. Uh, we're going to do a little bit of analysis on that. Is Iran going to war? Are we going to have a war? Is it all happening? Is it World War Three? I don't know. We'll, uh, we'll have to live and see. Uh, so, so thank you very much, Stephen, for coming on, and, um, and we're going to hear for you in a second. Um, I'm going to read out a little bit of a monologue now, and then we'll go on. So gold prices rallied to a six-year highs last week and continued posting gains on Monday at 14, uh, 1,403 per ounce. China, boosting its gold stockpile to shift away from the US dollar, has added to the precious metals resurgence. The People's Bank of China has purchased more than 70 tons of gold since December. According to the World Gold Council, the WGC, before that, before that the Chinese Central Bank uh, had not reported an increase in gold reserves for more than two years, and the official figures remained unchanged from October 2016 to November 2018. The increased gold purchasing by Asia's top economy comes at a time when global central banks are accumulating the precious metal in record numbers. Russia has been a t the top buyer of gold, adding about 274 tons of its reserves last year. In the first five months of 2019, Russia added 78 tons of gold to its coffers, increasing the metal's share in its international reserves by 3.7%. Gold reserves of the central banks around the world surged by 651.5 tons or 74% year on year in 2018, data from the World Gold Council showed. Analysts say Beijing was doubling down on gold to diversify its reserves away from the greenback or the US dollar standard. The country has been selling off U.S. Treasuries lately, with its holdings having plunged from the peak of $1.3 trillion in late 2013 to about $1.1 trillion in April. Beijing is worried U.S.-China ties could get worse, so the PBOC has jumped to stockpile its gold reserves, said Tom McGra McGra McGregor, Beijing-based journalist and political analyst. Gold is a safe haven investment, added McGregor, who is a senior editor for China's national broadcaster, CCTV. Gold has been quietly underperforming most G10 currencies since the US-China trade war began. Uh, Skoda Bank commodity uh, strategist Nikki Shields told the Kiko News he described it as the latest rally as a dangle bold breakout that excludes metals usual direct correlation with the US dollar the world's two largest economies uh, and US China have been involved in the trans conflict since 2000, March 2005. The escalation of US tariffs has increased 25% on $200 billion worth of Chinese goods in China in response to introduced duties on 25% of 5,000 of US products in America. So, sorry, I, I just got to get rid of the, the teleprompter speed on that one. I, I was, it's, I've got to get used to that. So, so basically, China is buying gold. Russia is buying gold. Iran is buying gold. These these countries. This is this is a story that we've seen before. Because when I met you at Liberty Fest, I like gold. I've been talking about gold, gold, silver, Bitcoin. Um, it's the three big. It's it's if you want to diversify outside of these. Uh, the U.S. dollar, the Australian dollar, the renminbi, if you want to d diversify outside of these fiat currencies, uh, we're all running 
to these safe haven commodities. Uh, what, do, what do you say, Stephen Wells, on gold, on silver, on Bitcoin? You're a, fr you're a freedom man. You're a liberty man. You, you were there at Liberty Fest. You're big on all the alternative currencies and you're big on gold and silver. So what do you say about these moves from central banks in, in China and Russia and Iran and, and in the ECB where they're buying up global reserves, buying up gold in order to hedge against an ever inflating US dollar? Yeah, it's... I, I, on the one side of things, you, you, I've been waiting for uh, three or four, five years now. Um, people keep talking about gold and have been for a long time. And uh, we keep sort of waiting for gold to finally um, show its worth again and for the, for the debt Ponzi scheme to finally sort of collapse in on itself and for real money to come back again. So um, um, it, it's it's... On, on one side of things, I'm, I'm always thinking that it's going to go sooner or later. Um, and on the other side of things, each time there is a news report about gold coming out and central banks buying it and stuff, you know, I, I wonder whether it's going to be a false signal again or not, because there, there's been so many of them in the past. Yeah, you're right. So, so what's what's been happening is every time gold has started to go up, and we've all started to say, "Oh, you know, it's 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 going on this time. It's it's the time that it's all happening," and, and then the central banks buy and they suppress the price, and they've kept it under under those uh, those those magic prices, uh, which allow pri uh, gold to go up. Uh, if you look at um, Mike Maloney, he's got those famous books about. Uh, gold and precious metals and he says that societies are based on cyclical notions they start off with one to one ratios uh, of gold so they everyone walks around with a piece of gold and silver in their pocket and then as time goes on as time goes on um, they become fiat backs and so then you have a bit of paper and a bit of gold and then eventually the state grows you know and, and this is what the freedom people like yourself and the freedom people at liberty fest this is the message that they're trying to push they're trying to say don't let your state get too out of control don't let it too, too large because it just eats into your prosperity because because it gets too many uh it gets too complicated to control too many assets across too many uh, too too vast a geopolitical region and if you want a strong currency and if you want a currency that's backed on gold then you need to keep your state small. You can't have too many federal employees. I mean, you're on board with the whole... Are you, you're not an anarchist or something, are you? I don't remember you ever saying you're an anarchist, right? You're not politically an anarchist, are you? No. At the end of the day, if you get rid of one government, it could be a vacuum and somebody else is going to move in. So um, it's, it's a question of um, who's going to be in there and uh, what can we do to... Um, to have a check on their power. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we've, we're, we're heading more and more in the West um, to, uh, you know, a, a bigger government, more intrusive government, uh, a bigger bureaucracy. It's growing every year. Um, I, I don't think we're at the end of it yet. I think it's going to get a lot worse in the West before it's going to get better. Um, and how on finance markets, um, I've, I've got a feeling that they're going to run. They're, they're going to they're going to keep it um, ticking along for a fair bit long. But I think this, you know, we, we've seen you know when, you know when when Europe had the crisis, that crisis with Greece and Spain and Italy and, and Ireland, um, they'll do whatever it takes to uh, you know to pop it up for as long as they can. So um, uh, you know, my, my thought. Thoughts are that it's, it's still got some time to run, um, and you know the gold side of things with uh, the central banks. You know, it's very very hard to see into what they're actually planning, but I can't personally see it uh, breaking out for you know the average do average Joe who's gone out and you know and bought a few few coins down at um, uh, you know down at the uh, the gold bank. Um, it, it, I've still got a sort of a personal feeling that. Um, the, the central banks are still in a system chugging along for a fair bit longer yet. Um, and obviously, the longer they do it, the worse it's going to be when it finally goes, um, which is why they're trying so hard to uh, to prop it up uh, as, as they are. And do you think do you think one of the reasons because we're looking at all this uh, news out of Iran, you know, they just shot down one of these drones that was flying. They, they're not really sure whether it was in Iranian space or out. Both sides are saying different things. 
do you think things like Iran, geopolitical events like Iran, uh, these are the reasons that they're kicking the can down the road because they have other uh, imperial ambitions that they, they're trying to yet fulfill and they're not worried about scooping what wealth they can off, off, the, off, the, off the population that's been decimated over and over and over again? Is that, do you think the reason they're deferring it is because they have other, other things to deal with? Endgame is, uh, you know, for all the players involved, is, is the throne, if you're into Game of Thrones, it's, I mean, um, there are people playing for the world at the moment, uh, and they want the world, uh, and they've been looking at the world for, for decades now, so uh, the Middle Eastern conflict is, um, you know, uh, there's a lot of it pushed by Israel, wanting a greater Israel, uh, you know, there is America wanting resources, there is, um, there's, there's a whole range of things. There's, there's a whole range of players who are have got different goals and different aspirations of, of why they want it. Um, but at the end of the day, everyone's playing for the same thing, which is you know you know want to be everyone wants to rule the world. So um, the hardest thing at the moment with this sort of thing is, is how to read Trump because Trump has. Uh, has flashed his muscles a few times since he started the uh, presidency. And if you think back to North Korea and everyone thinking that there was going to be World War Three over there. And then the next thing you know, he does a deal with, um, you know, with Pyongyang, and 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 it's and all of a sudden he, he you know, he's he's the big deal maker again. So uh, you never really know where you stand with Trump. Why he's doing it? Is he is he just flashing his muscles again so he can he can get some better deal with the U.S. Or are the neocons in his government uh, uh, pushing for the same old thing that, that they were pushing in Bush's day? It's, it's very, very hard to get a read on geopolitics at the moment. Well, yeah, Trump Trump argued when he was a candidate, this is a very interesting point that's coming out of Perth here, this is a very interesting point, because the, Trump argued as a candidate, we don't want this total stability, because uh, the, the departments of the governments were getting very cosy with sort of projecting what they were trying to do, and he said, all right, we've got to throw in some confusion into the system. And I think... He's done that on multiple levels. Whether he knows what he's doing or not is kind of irrelevant, but he's definitely thrown the seeds of confusion in. And people, you're right. One day, one day he's, uh, one day it seems like the neocons are on top and John Bolton's on top and Jared Kushner's running around and then suddenly it all switched back and then Trump's, Trump's on top and Trump's running around. Uh, one thing I can be pretty, pretty certain on is there was no Russia collusion. Uh, there was no Russia connection and it was a big waste of time. And, um, and, you know, it kept the Democrats busy for three years, so that's good. At least they were busy doing something. Uh, but, 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 yeah, you're right. Uh, this, is, this is, you're completely right. So he's done this before on, on with North Korea, and he came out on top. I mean, Kim Jong-un sort of backed down after a while, and that was it. But Iran is a different player. Iran is a big player. I mean, we're talking about a former world power, the Persian Empire. We're talking about a country that has been around for a long time. It's very strong. It's been through all the problems in the Middle East. It's had wars on its borders uh, for a long time, both in Iraq and both in, in Afghanistan on the other time, on the other side. And it, and it can put up with a lot of um, pain. It, it's, 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 its country can absorb a lot of pressure. Um, um, so what, what, So do you think that, do you think that America... You know, do you think that there's any, there's any strategic reason for America to go in there that's on the American side? Or do you think it's just uh, the allies in that area, in that region that are pushing for this or something? Uh, what, what's, your, what's your take on America's reason, if there was a war potentially? Um, why would America, what's its, in its interest in order to take on this big ancient sort of country? Uh, the same reason that America takes on anything, it just wishes to to expand its its power um, and you know as I said there are people who want total control and there are people in the way of that there are countries in the way of that um, but it's a dangerous game because you know Iran um, doesn't stand alone it's not like North Korea um, there are uh, you know China and Russia um, don't particularly want the US to expand any further and so um, it's a very dangerous game we're playing um, there is a, you know, a lot of speculation about what actually has gone down with that ship. Um, you know, the, 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 the mentions of false flags are, are, are popping up around the internet again. 
um, and it you know wouldn't be the first time. So yeah, um, it's 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 very very hard to know uh, whether you've got um, people with their heads put on their shoulders who are trying to get some strategic advantage and are going to back down sooner or later, or whether you've got lunatics running the asylum. Um, yeah, this this but, is why yeah, this... it's a difficult. Yeah, this is why we've been talking about gold and, and silver for a long time, because you have to hedge not only against financial risks, but also against geopolitical risks. Another geopolitical phenomenon, and something you're, you're more of an expert in, which is uh, fascinating, is climate change. Uh, climate change, uh, you're, you're, you're one of the skeptics floating around. Is that, is that a fair term? Am I, am I misrepresenting you on that, on that point? Not, not at all. Um, I, I'm... I'm uh... I, I proudly embrace the term denier. It's what uh, uh, people who wish to, um, the, what the detractors wish to uh, label us with so they can uh, associate us with uh, denying the, the Nazi Holocaust and, and make us look bad. But I figure if someone's going to call you a name, you may as well just embrace it and, and have fun with it. So, um, yeah, I'm as uh, as skeptical as they get. Okay. Uh, in, in, in nobody on the planet. In that context, give us a quick, give us the the Perth Stephen Wells summary of uh, of what it is to be a skeptic or a denier. Uh, what what is that? What does it entail? Uh, how far does that go? I mean, how do you have a do you have a, a dartboard with um, uh, what's his name's face on it? I mean, <laughs> without gore. Yeah, oh good. Have you got a dartboard in your room? Can if you swing the camera around, can I see the dartboard? Uh, no, I, I, there is there is there is no malice in me. There, are, um, I, it wouldn't surprise me if, um, uh, if there's not know, enough none. There's not enough money in denying. No, no, it's 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 all in, it's all in the, uh, in the in the believers' camp. And uh, if there's going to be any dartboards, it'll be of my face. And they'll be throwing dartboards darts at me, I reckon, not, not the other way around. Um, there is there is a guy, an Australian guy. Um, I've been in my book. I can't remember his name, but he's uh, there's a guy. He's an Australian guy, and he's at the uh, University of Austria, and he's called for people like myself uh, to be executed. Um, that just for having the opinions that we've got, we should be uh, put up. We should be uh, publicly executed because. Worse than murderers and worse than pedophiles. So, so he's a he's a uh, he's he's a he's a climate change jihadi. He's as bad as the people in Saudi Arabia. He, on one hand, I bet you anything, he condemns human rights in Saudi Arabia. I'll give you that much. But then he turns around and he says, "But those those denying people over there, they need to get the same punishment." So he's he's a hypocrite. That's what he is. Uh, absolutely, but, but I mean, but, but those crimes and crimes, so those. There's people who murder a few individuals. There are even people like Hitler who, who genocide a lot of people. But me, uh, I'm worse than the lot because I'm endangering everybody. The whole world's going to die if, if I get my way. Mm. And that's what they believe. So um, I'm up for the chopping block. So I don't know how much longer you, you'll see me alive. I expect within a few years I'll be off to the gulags and um, uh, and uh, and that will be the last that you see of me because uh, the there are there are people who uh, who think that I'm a very I, 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 I can I can think of a punishment so this is this is just a random punishment I thought but what they could do is they could tie you your feet to the to next to the ocean and they can just slowly drown you over time oh well you know I, uh, only uh, only yesterday I was looking at the projections for Perth uh, of the sea level rise and um, the, the local council having listened to the United Nations has got uh, a little a red line shown along the coast where in a hundred years time the, the oceans are going to be six feet uh, higher than they are now so yeah that, that'll be a very good punishment just just tie me to a pole on um, on the ocean and i'm sure within minutes literally minutes uh, the seas will have uh, risen so much that i will be uh, i will be gurgling my words to my my, my watery death there you go so the, the so, man yeah, in austria the, will be very happy with that so tell us. Absolutely. So. I love it. So so tell us. So tell us briefly what you guys believe, what you think is going to happen. What what your your yeah, give us about a five minute synopsis on what 
what it is as you sum it up, you know, the elevator pitch of denial. Well, well, my elevator pitch of denial is that the greenhouse effect itself is actually pseudoscience, that uh, we took a wrong turning in science about 100 years ago. And so they tell you that um, because of carbon dioxide and water vapor, uh, that this makes the surface of the planet uh, 33 degrees warmer than it would be if all the water uh, vapor and carbon dioxide disappeared. And it is my uh, assertion that that is demonstrably false. Uh, you only have to look other planets in the solar system and look at what the temperatures are at the same atmospheric pressures as we have here on Earth. And it's a very, very quick and simple uh, calculation to show that there is no difference in temperature other than what distance from the sun creates. So uh, everything about this, this, this subject is, is fraudulent from the greenhouse effects to the claims of global warming to the renewable energy uh, target and money that's being thrown at that um, to money that's been thrown at local councils to money that's coming from the UN. Uh, it's just one great big cesspool of uh, corruption and um, dishonesty. And, uh, you know, in terms of the geopolitical side of things and uh, the financial side of things, which you're looking at, a lot of the, the growth in big government comes from uh, this scam. Um, so if you want to know why it's going to get bigger and why it's going to continue to get bigger for longer and why the Ponzi scheme is going to be kept alive. It's because the basis of it is um, the Agenda 21 um, summit, which was held in 1990 at the Rio uh, Earth Summit, and, and all of the programs that have come on from there, which, which basically call for um, dissolving of property rights and um, dissolving of national borders and basically running everything through a top-down central planning um, global governance system. So um, there are some lot of uh, unpleasant people trying to do some unpleasant things, and uh, we're all paying for it in ways that you can't even begin to imagine. Have they evolved from the Agenda 21 to the Agenda 30 now? Because I've been reading about Agenda 30, 2030. Is that, is that still a thing? Yeah, well, so it's basically Agenda 2030 is basically just updated Agenda 21. So they've moved on. Um, it's now the implementation stage. So when you hear um, Alexandria Cadio Cortez or whatever her name is talking about, we've got 11 years to save the planet. Um, that's that's why that date is is, is chosen uh, 2030 um, because they're trying to implement all of these things where. You know, they get rid of cars and roads and, and buses and trains and planes for everybody apart from um, the select few who uh, who run the Politburos. Yeah, because essentially so, yeah, it is it is communism, right? It's 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 trying to get a, a communism sort of adopted, and and this is what uh, I'm not sure if you follow, but I mean, real hardcore patriots like the James uh, Birch Society and others, uh, you know, who watch global governments and who are afraid of global governments, they were always saying this because they were they were they were trying to stop communist infiltration of of West, and they were saying they're going to do it through sub subversive means, uh, through Islam, through climate through uh big government through welfareism through eternal war perpetual war and by superseding like ceding their authority to larger international institutions including but not only the united nations so you're saying that the united nations is implementing a global fear campaign uh in order to implement communism is that is that what you're saying pretty much um you know, they may call it by another name, but um, uh, sustainable development is the is the um, uh, is the double speak Orwellian uh, term that they they've used. Um, so you know, you you, you can't, can't turn on the, the television these days without hearing the word sustainable. Uh, it, it all stems back from a book written by um, Maurice Strong, uh, who was a protege of the Rockefeller um, family and uh, a former Norwegian um, prime minister, I think, can't remember what position was in Norway, but um, she was also the, the leader of the, of the Global Socialism Society. And they wrote a book, which eventually turned into the Agenda 21 uh, document and treaty, 
which has then since been uh, um, you know implement basically has been implemented it's being implemented now um, there are various governments around the world who have who have signed on um, covertly without their populations knowing about it and there are various uh, governmental agencies now um, implementing various programs right down to the local government level um, where you know a local bureaucrat just basically gets a directive saying you need to cover this in your report and you know it, it gets done so much of it's happening without even people even knowing it even the people who are doing it don't actually realize that they're doing it <laughs> yeah well because they've clou they've clouded it and coded it in um sort of bureaucratic terms i mean you said yourself it's it's called what's sustainable development nowadays um sustainability doesn't imply uh exponential population growth or exponential technology curves um it, it implies uh a plateauing of everything uh, and i guess that's that's what they see because they might see that so so my, my question i guess as as someone in in your position what about what about genuine concerns of of rainforest deforest uh, like deforestation of acidity of the oceans of plastic in the oceans are there genuine concerns that we can be worried about as a community uh what what is your what is, what's the, the what's the deny do they do they worry about these things do they care about these things or do they simply say oh, all of it is propaganda what what's what's the what's how do we are there environmental concerns we should be worried about what, what what's the what's the stance over there at the De denying a uh, area the arena uh, pr pretty pretty much uh to um if if there's an issue in your local area that you can see and touch with your you know with your eyes and with your hands yourself then there is a problem for you to go out and solve so like for example in, in perth there is a bit of a, an issue with litter you know litter on the streets that's a genuine problem but it doesn't take a global government system to uh, to solve it. It just takes, you know, a local community getting together and solving its local issues. Just about everything that you can think of that we've been uh, pushed down our throats for the past 40 years that has to do with the environment is either outright false or grossly exaggerated, or it's being caused by some somebody else and you are being made to... Um, uh, to pay for a, a virtue signaling solution which won't actually change anything you can take for example like plastic in the ocean you mentioned uh, so what's the virtue signaling um, solution that we've been told that we have to do well we're, we're no longer allowed to go and have uh, a free plastic bag at the shops and what's it going to do it's going to do absolutely nothing why well first of all because 99 percent of the plastic that's going into the ocean isn't going into the ocean from any western countries we, we, we solved plastic in the ocean and litter in the ocean and and general messiness and, and trash. We solved that 50, 60 years ago. Um, we have one, uh, you know, we have wonderful rubbish collections. We have you know, great waste management systems. We don't put very much trash in the, the ocean. So banning plastic bags here in Australia is going to do absolutely bugger all to stop plastic going into the ocean down the Yangtze River in China. Yeah, what about what That's about? Just one yeah, that is that is one example. Feeler, remember feeler? I think it's a feeler bins or something. China, there was a recent report. Did you see it? China has stopped buying global rubbish because they they yeah. don't want it. What, what what do you what do you say about that? They should, they, they should never have, we should never have sent it there in the first place. I mean, why would you send your rubbish to a to, to the country that's most responsible for? Uh, for, for, for getting into the oceans well they're picking yeah. through it they're getting out the components they're getting out the chips they're getting the gold and the all the all the stuff we've got about two minutes left i just i just wanted to say um so you, you you're 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 saying that local local levels of authority need to take more responsibility so countries have to take more responsibility for their local area local communities and local towns and individuals have to take more responsibility and we have to push less responsibility or let let these international institutions and governance structures uh take uh, suck up that responsibility because they're misusing it is that is that the idea well the the main reason they're doing it is to abolish property rights see sustainable development basically means that somebody has to decide what is sustainable and what isn't whereas normally you would decide for yourself what is sustainable and good or bad on your property if 
it's a global problem, then somebody else has to solve it and dictate to you what you can and can't do on your own property. And so this is, this is the whole structure behind it. If you do it locally and if you do it based on property rights and you base, do it based on this is my house and I wish to take care of it and this is my neighbor and he is impacting on my property because he's a messy bugger, that is a, a solution via property rights. That's, that's how we've had it and that's what we want. That's what makes the West successful. Mm. But if you go the other way in sustainable development and you've got somebody in a, you know, in an office in, in the United Nations saying, oh, well, I don't think plastic should be allowed anymore or I don't think fossil fuels should be allowed anymore, then to implement that, you have to abolish property rights. You have to subvert them and make them subordinate to these organizations. So it, it's very, very, you know, for anybody who cares about finance and about their own financial well-being, um, it's more than just a thing about the environment. It's, it's the core of our society and the core of our wealth is our property rights, and we must defend them to the death. As a, as a capitalist, uh, I 100% agree with you because I believe personally that the, the, the solutions will come from the free market and that all of these sort of guys are getting in the road of making those solutions possible. We're going to have to, we're going to, have to cut it off here, but we're going, to, we're, going to, we're going to go with a part two because this is so interesting, and you're touching on absolutely core factors i mean property rights are at the center of what of what is the western civilization and 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 what makes us uh great um so we're touching on very key and core and we'll have to leave it for another episode and i want to have you ever will you will you will you will you do this again with me sometime absolutely i'll just uh, quickly plug my book while i'm at oh it. absolutely go for it confessions of a climate change denier by Stephen Wells. Um, if you don't know anything about science and you've never really liked science, then this, this is the book for you. It's uh, it's written for people, ordinary people, in layman's language, so you can understand the issues without having to go out and get a calculator and get a, a degree in mathematics. So I'm gonna I'm gonna get out there. I'm gonna people. I'm gonna get out there and buy myself a copy of that and give it to my friends and stuff because you know I want to I want to understand that side of the argument because. Uh, I'm, I'm, I invested uh, I invested in renewables because I knew that the government was forcing everyone to do it so to make money right but it's not because I believed it it was just a market distortion so that's that's kind of what happened uh, I'm not gonna lie about that if you're if you're an investor you have to follow the money right you have to follow it so anyway thank that's you very it. much Stephen Wells and uh, thank you for we'll do this again sometime and I think the audience will love that um, we'll try and get some better internet too that'd be really good thank you very much no worries. Come on the show. All right. Thank you.